Section twenty six of History of Egypt, Volume two by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter three. The First Theban Empire, Part two. A family which, to judge from the fact that its members affected the name of Montapu, originally came from Hermonthus, settled in Thebes and made that town the capital of a small principality, which rapidly enlarged its borders at the expense of the neighboring nomes. All the towns and cities of the plain, Madufk, Hufuik, Zorit, Hermonthus, and towards the south, Aphroditepolis Parva, at the gorge of the two mountains, Gebelin, which formed the frontier of the fife of el Kab, Kusit towards the north, Dendera, and Hu, all fell into the hands of the Theban princes, and enormously increased their territory. After the lapse of a very few years, their supremacy was accepted more or less willingly by the adjacent principalities of el Kab, Elephantine, Koptos, Kasser es Said, Thinis, and Ekmim. Antuf, the founder of the family, claimed no other title than that of Lord of Thebes, and still submitted to the suzerainty of the Heracleopolitan kings. His successors considered themselves strong enough to cast off this allegiance, if not to usurp all the insignity of royalty, including the Uraeus and the Cartouche. Montthapu I, Antuf II, and Antuf III must have occupied a somewhat remarkable position among the great lords of the south, since their successors credited them with the possession of a unique preamble. It is true that the historians of a later date did not venture to place them on a par with the kings who were actually independent. They enclosed their names in the cartouche without giving them a prenomen, but at the same time they invested them with a title not met with elsewhere, that of the first Horus, Horutapi. They exercised considerable power from the outset. It extended over southern Egypt, over Nubia, and over the valleys lying between the Nile and the Red Sea. The origin of the family was somewhat obscure, but in support of their ambitious projects they did not fail to invoke the memory of pretended alliances between their ancestors and daughters of the solar race. They boasted of their descent from the Papis, from Irsirniri Anu, Sahuri, and Snofru, and claimed that the antiquity of their titles did away with the more recent rights of their rivals. The revolt of the Theban princes put an end to the Ninth Dynasty, and although supported by the feudal powers of central and northern Egypt, and more especially by the lords of the Terebinth Nobe, who viewed the sudden prosperity of the Thebans with a very evil eye, the Tenth Dynasty did not succeed in bringing them back to their allegiance. The family which held the fief of Siut when the war broke out had ruled there for three generations. Its first appearance on the scene of history coincided with the accession of Akthos, and its elevation was probably the reward of services rendered by its chief to the head of the Heracleopolitan family. From this time downwards the title of ruler, Hiku, which the pharaohs themselves sometimes condescended to take, was hereditary in the family, who grew in favor from year to year. Kiti I, the fourth of this line of princes, was brought up in the palace of Heracleopolis, and had learned to swim with the royal children. On his return home he remained the personal friend of the king, and governed his domains wisely, clearing the canals, fostering agriculture, and lightening the taxes without neglecting the army. His heavy infantry, recruited from among the flower of the people of the north, and his light infantry, drawn from the pick of the people of the south, were counted by thousands. He resisted the Theban pretensions with all his might, and his son, Tefabi, followed in his footsteps. The first time, said he, that my foot-soldiers fought against the nomes of the south, which were gathered together from Elephantine in the south to Ga on the north, I conquered those nomes, I drove them towards the southern frontier, I overran the left bank of the Nile in all directions. When I came to a town I threw down its walls, I seized its chief, I imprisoned him at the port, landing-place, until he paid me ransom. As soon as I had finished with the left bank, and there were no longer found any who dared resist, I passed to the right bank. Like a swift hare I set full sail for another chief. I sailed by the north wind as by the east, by the south as by the west, and him whose ship I boarded I vanquished utterly. He was cast into the water, his boats fled to shore, his soldiers were as bulls on whom falleth the lion. I compassed his city from end to end, I seized his goods, I cast them into the fire. Thanks to his energy and courage, 
he extinguished the rebellion by the counsel and according to the tactics of the jackal, Ua Pau Itu, god of Siut. From that time no district of the desert was safe from his terrors, and he carried flame at his pleasure among the nomes of the south. Even while bringing desolation to his foes, he sought to repair the ills which the invasion had brought upon his own subjects. He administered such strict justice that evildoers disappeared as though by magic. When night came, he who slept on the roads blessed me, because he was as safe as in his own house, for fear which was shed abroad by my soldiers protected him, and the cattle in the fields were as safe there as in the stable. The thief had become an abomination to the god, and he no longer oppressed the serf so that the latter ceased to complain, and paid the exact dues of his land for love of me. In the time of Kiiti the second, the son of Tefabi, the Heracleopolitans were still masters of northern Egypt, but their authority was even then menaced by the turbulence of their own vassals, and Heracleopolis itself drove out the pharaoh Mirikari, who was obliged to take refuge in Siut with that Kiti whom he called his father. Kiti gathered together such an extensive fleet, that it encumbered the Nile from Shashhapu to Gebel Abu Fada, from one end of the principality of the Terebinth to the other. Vainly did the rebels unite with the Thebans. Kiti sowed terror over the world, and himself alone chastised the nomes of the south. While he was descending the river to restore the king to his capital, the sky grew serene, and the whole country rallied to him. The commanders of the south and the archers of Heracleopolis their legs tremble beneath them when the royal Uraeus, ruler of the world, comes to suppress crime. The earth trembles, the south takes ship and flies, all men flee in dismay, the towns surrender, for fear takes hold on their members. Mirikari's return was a triumphal progress. When he came to Heracleopolis the people ran forth to meet him, rejoicing in their lord, women and men together, old men as well as children. But fortune soon changed. Beaten again and again, the Thebans still returned to the attack. At length they triumphed, after a struggle of nearly two hundred years, and brought the two rival divisions of Egypt under their rule. The few glimpses to be obtained of the early history of the first Theban dynasty gave the impression of an energetic and intelligent race. Confined to the mostly thinly populated, that is, the least fertile part of the valley, and engaged on the north in a ceaseless warfare which exhausted their resources, they still found time for building both at Thebes and in the most distant parts of their dominions. If their power made but little progress southwards, at least it did not recede, and that part of Nubia lying between Aswan and the neighborhood of Korosko remained in their possession. The tribes of the desert, the Amamiu, the Mazayu, and the Uauayu, often disturbed the husbandmen by their sudden raids, yet having pillaged a district, they did not take possession of it as conquerors but hastily returned to their mountains. The Theban princes kept them in check by repeated counter-raids, and renewed the old treaties with them. The inhabitants of the great oasis in the west, and the migratory peoples of the land of the gods, recognized the Theban suzerainty on the traditional terms. As in the times of Uni, the barbarians made up the complement of the army with soldiers who were more inured to hardships, and more accustomed to the use of arms, than the ordinary fellahin and several obscure pharaohs, such as Monthapu I and Antuf III, owed their boasted victories over Libyans and Asiatics to the energy of their mercenaries. But the kings of the eleventh dynasty were careful not to wander too far from the valley of the Nile. Egypt presented a sufficiently wide field for their activity, and they exerted themselves to the utmost to remedy the evils from which the country had suffered for hundreds of years. They repaired the forts, restored or enlarged the temples, and evidences of their building are found at Koptos, Gebelin, el Kab, and Abydos. Thebes itself has been too often overthrown since that time for any traces of the work of the eleventh dynasty kings in the temple of Ammon to be distinguishable, but her necropolis is still full of their eternal homes, stretching in lines across the plain, opposite Karnak, at Dra'abu Lanaga, and on the northern slopes of the valley of Deir el-Bahari. Some were excavated in the mountainside, and presented a square façade of dressed stone, surmounted by a pointed roof in the shape of a pyramid. Others were true pyramids, sometimes having a pair of obelisks in front of them, as well as a temple. None of them attained to the dimensions of the Memphite tombs, for with only its own resources at command, 
the kingdom of the South could not build monuments to compete with those whose construction had taxed the united efforts of all Egypt. But it used a crude black brick, made without grit or straw, where the Egyptians of the North had preferred more costly stone. These inexpensive pyramids were built on a rectangular base not more than six and a half feet high, and the whole erection, which was simply faced with whitewashed stucco, never exceeded thirty-three feet in height. The sepulchre chamber was generally in the centre. In shape it resembled an oven, its roof being vaulted by the overlapping of the courses. Often also it was constructed partly in the base, and partly in the foundations below the base, the empty space above it being intended merely to lighten the weight of the masonry. There was not always an external chapel attached to these tombs, but a stele placed on the substructure, or fixed in one of the outer faces, marked the spot to which offerings were to be brought for the dead. Sometimes, however, there was the addition of a square vestibule in front of the tomb, and here, on prescribed days, the memorial ceremonies took place. The statues of the double were rude and clumsy, the coffins heavy and massive, and the figures with which they were decorated inelegant and out of proportion, while the stele are very rudely cut. From the time of the sixth dynasty, the lords of the Said had been reduced to employing workmen from Memphis to adorn their monuments, but the rivalry between the Thebans and the Heracleopolitans, which set the two divisions of Egypt against each other in constant hostility, obliged the Antufs to entrust the execution of their orders to the local schools of sculptors and painters. It is difficult to realize the degree of rudeness to which the unskilled workmen who made certain of the Aminti and Gebelin sarcophagi must have sunk, and even at Thebes itself, or at Abydos, the execution of both bas-reliefs and hieroglyphs shows minute carefulness rather than any real skill or artistic feeling. Failing to attain to the beautiful, the Egyptians endeavored to produce the sumptuous. Expeditions to the Wadi Hamarnat to fetch blocks of granite for sarcophagi became more and more frequent, and wells were sunk from point to point along the road leading from Koptos to the mountains. Sometimes these expeditions were made the occasion for pushing on as far as the port of Sao, and embarking on the Red Sea. A hastily constructed boat cruised along by the shore, and gum, incense, gold, and the precious stones of the country were brought from the land of the troglodytes. On the return of the convoy with its block of stone, and various packages of merchandise, there was no lack of scribes to recount the dangers of the campaign in exaggerated language, or to congratulate the reigning pharaoh on having sown abroad the fame and terror of his name in the countries of the gods, and as far as the land of Puanit. End of section 26. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.